the vendor said Donka Shane to me. I was like, <laughs> and I asked my guide, I was like, Donka Shane, why did he say Donka Shane? He's like, well, here you look German. I was like, what? Say word, I look German here? Okay, all right, back home I look like a crackhead who just fixed her life. Okay, crackhead may be a bit extreme. Maybe a Muppet? She said that I looked like Beaker. She's not wrong. She's had a really diverse career in entertainment and yet still cool enough to represent the Wu-Tang Clan. You, ha you have Wu-Tang Clan crop. I have, do you want me to show them? Wait, hold on. Wow. You know what it is. Comedian, podcaster, TV host, the talented and unique Jessie Mae Peluso on The Pulse. These are limited editions, baby. Guys, welcome to another episode of The Pulse, bringing on people, sharing their stories, people with success and different experiences and doing cool things. And Jesse Mae Peluso falls into that category, one of those cool people we have the pleasure to have on The Pulse. How are you today? Aren't you glad I he I'm here? Ah, see what you did right there? So your assistant was clowning your outfit? Like what? She was clowning my outfit. She said that I looked like Beaker. She's not wrong. We decided she's not wrong. It's rude, but it's very accurate. So I'm here being Muppet friendly today in my sleeves. It's like two emotional support pets on my on my <laughs> ankles or my wrists. Comedian, host, podcaster, advocate. And we're going to talk about that as well as you've gotten involved in a lot of different topics. But before we get in deep into the discussion, you have some odd shows and experiences <laughs> and things on your resume. <laughs> so I'm preparing for the interview and I'm on your page and surviving paradise is the first thing that pops up. What are you willing to do to make your way back to this villa? No one is going to be able to trust me after this. Hey! This is your new show. Yes. <laughs> is surviving <laughs> paradise and how did you decide to do that you know they said do you want to go to greece for two months i said yes i do okay i don't even know what i'm doing uh, literally my agent called she goes i have a job for you in greece i go yes she's like you don't want to hear the terms i go i heard the terms it's greece you know for me where i'm at in life i'm a mature woman i like you have said have done a lot of weird jobs now i only want to do and be a part of projects that are interesting, new, fun, and that call my soul. I'm very much into my gut feeling and my intuition, and this just called to me. I, I thought it was unique, challenging in a different way, because it is not a comedy-style show that is not the, the general feel or tone at all. So I thought it would be challenging from a creative aspect. Across the board, it was a, a challenge, and I thought, life is short. Let's do something that makes me feel completely uncomfortable and be a part of a great production. This is before you knew what the show was. This was yes. when it was just Grease. The show is basically, it's like the love child of Survivor, Big Brother, and Love Island. And uh, a bunch of contestants show up. They think they're going to be living in luxury. What they don't know is that they're going to get thrown into the woods, and they're going to have to battle to stay in luxury and to win the $100,000 at the end of the show. Now, did you have to stay in the woods, or did you get to go luxury? You see this jacket? I you know, think I right? stayed in the woods with this jacket? <laughs> right. Are you crazy? All right. So you still got die. grease. You still oh, got I grease. Was... Like, it was still a good deal with your agent. Because that agent's getting fired if they take you out into the woods. But that may not be the oddest thing <laughs> that we have right. on the resume. I'm on your Instagram page. The Last of Us. Is that real? <laughs> the last of us. I know the show, and I've watched the show, and I'm watching you voicing like one of the zombies, and I'm sitting there going, I can't decide if that's real, if this was a comedy routine. <laughs> use a coffee i was actually in studio doing voiceover for surviving paradise okay and the last of us had just sort of come out with their voiceover actors in the studio doing work for that and i thought it would be funny to show me in the studio and people thought i was a part of the cast you well, were really you good at it. 
<laughs> we should ask HBO just to give me a part. I uh, wanted to ask you how much you get paid for that. Because I wanted to sit there nothing. and figure they that one out. Nothing. They owe me money. Out. Nice. All right. I'm, I'm not going to keep going through stuff. Tattoo, redo. You, know. you go through whatever you want. This is your show. All this kind of stuff. Is this just fun? Yeah, are you? Because it seems like you just sit there and you're going, okay, you know, let's do a let's do a cover up tattoos and hang out with people. Let's go in the middle of the woods in Greece. Like you're just living your best life. I am attracted to shows that are fun, and shows that I think are different from anything I've ever done. I am having a great time. It is challenging to be away from home. I'm a I'm a huge homebody. I like to be home with my creatures and I like my creature comforts when I'm home, but I am having fun. I, I, I do believe I was put on this earth to bring joy to people. One of my friends called me a joy machine and I was like, oh, maybe that's what I am. Maybe one of my reasons for being here and my purpose is to bring joy and to alleviate other people's stress and pain and whatever they're going through, through whatever show I'm hosting or a part of. And that's, what I've decided to embrace. And if I'm going to do a job in Greece or if I'm going to do a job in Burbank, I'm going to be there completely and have as much fun as I can so that whoever's watching can believe what I'm doing because I'm experiencing it in real time and being present and being a part of it. Was that always you? Like, was that you when you first decided to get into comedy? That was me from what, uh, the first time I could think about even having memories. My first audience member was my sister. And I used to do this thing that she had to remind me about called the closet lady, mm -hmm. where I would go in my mom's closet and pick one ha a hat, one boot, one high heel, an umbrella, a jacket, a skirt, and a crazy shirt. And I'd come out with all of it on and I'd do like a skit for my sister. So I was like doing stand up, ba bad stand up, when I was little for my sister, who was an audience member. And I just loved it so much. I remember just love loving her laugh and love making her laugh. To this day, I still love making her laugh. So I think a part of me has always felt that the stage was where I belonged or performing was what I was meant to do. I guess to answer your question, I think I've always been this way. I've always enjoyed comedy. I've always been drawn to it. And my father, all of his friends were stand-up comedians. I was, okay. you know, going to breakfast with stand-up comedians when I was a young kid and hearing them talk about the road and, and hearing that they got to leave town and go get money and make people laugh and come back. I was like, this is a career? How, where do I, where's the application? It was your father then who got you into, into comedy? Essentially, yes. I, I, it, it was his exposing me to, him exposing me to stand-up specials like back in the day the hbo comedy special was the thing it yeah. was such a special moment and we used to watch all of those i remember watching richard pryor and robin williams joan rivers paula poundstone george carlin you know all of these amazing late greats and seeing how they connected with my father and i think you know a girl always wants to have that connection with her father and and I think I just kind of drew a triangle for myself, like, oh, this is funny, and he's enjoying it. I need to learn how to be a part of that. I think just indirectly I absorbed a sense of humor through watching my father enjoy stand-up specials and then him subsequently exposing me to actual comedians from my hometown. You're a daddy's girl? Oh, yeah, through and through. Definitely a daddy's girl, youngest of four girls, the favorite. Shout out to the favorites in the house. <laughs> Coming up, she's been doing comedy for years, but life and her father's health, it managed to change her focus. When you're in those, in that like sort of darkness, you, you it's hard for you to even imagine there being anything else. So it, it is, you know, something that people need help. One thing that really helped me when my dad was sick was I was in the moment with him. I let him lead the conversation and I was silly with him and anytime he got angry or had an outburst, I wouldn't take it personally. I would try not to because I knew it was a disease and not him. I was looking at you kind of being an activist and advocate as we transition in and I one of the things that resonated as I was reading through uh, your bio when you lost your father oh. um, and kind of to Alzheimer's and that 
that struggle and you were a caretaker for a while. Um, and I, it resonated with me about how that changes you and kind of changes how you're living your life. Um, with all of the comedy, you're also using your voice now as an advocate and to share information about your father and your mother, really, but his experiences. Why? Because I know what, it's, what it feels like to feel completely lost, broken, and like there's no end in sight. And that's a horrible place to be. And that's where a lot of people live. A lot of people live in that space. A lot of people have created a reality within that darkness. And when you live in that darkness, when you live in that sadness and, and grief and struggle, it's hard for you to contribute to society and it's hard for you to reap the benefits of being a part of society and part of a community. So I feel like it's my duty or part of my duty to use whatever platform I have to reach someone who might be in that dark space to let them know, hey, you're not the only one. I have been there. A lot of life can look glossy and glamorous, but those people also go through difficulty and struggle and strife. And there are moments of clarity. There are moments of, of um, beauty and miracles, and there's silver lining through all of that. And so for me, to just tell jokes feels like I'm wasting a space where I can connect with people and give them some real reprieve and, and a real sense of belonging to something other than the dark space that they've been sort of living in. It seems like a, a cool kind of crossover platform to be able to share information with people, but also have the skills and talent to comfort them in those difficult times. I appreciate you saying that. And it's funny that you do, because I, I was just kind of ideating today about how to get into that deeper for my audience and people who enjoy me, my fans, if you will, and, and people who watch shows that I've been on. Like, how can I even go deeper into that area where I'm able to bridge my entertaining ways with education and with resources and with getting access to information that isn't always readily available. And let's be honest, I don't know about you, but sometimes there's so much information available that it gives you like this paralysis. Yeah. You know, they talk about like option paralysis. We, uh, we have too many options. Well, sometimes when you have too much information, you're not even able to take any in. So I wanna be able to break through all of that and package it in a bright, colorful outfit and be like, hey, yeah, grief is horrible. Here's a couple ways that you can manage that. Or Alzheimer's is one of the most brutal things I've ever experienced in my life. Do you want to know what parts of it were funny yeah. and what parts of it <laughs> weren't so bad? Because there's so many uh, difficult aspects of going through grief and going through Alzheimer's. I've got to be the one that shows up and be like, yeah, all that's real, but here's, here's, the, here's the real situation. Here's how you can get through it. So I appreciate you saying that. And, you know, yeah. for me, that's, that's the next chapter in my life and career is going deeper into that space and being more of a, a a place of resources and information for people dealing with these, you know, real experiences in life and hardships. It reminds people that even after your most difficult times, you will laugh again. Yes. We forget that. And for obvious reasons, when you're in those moments, and, and, and let me not I want to clarify and say, I don't think we should be in a happy place all the time. That's unrealistic. Happiness is a moment. It's an emotion. It's fleeting like all of our other emotions. But when you're in those, in that like sort of darkness, you, you it's hard for you to even imagine there being anything else. So it, it is, you know, something that people need help with. And I'm sure you've been there too. It, it's, it's hard for you to remember that you're going to laugh again. I honestly think it's as simple as just being able to be available to help other people. All of us need to be in that space. And, you know, a lot of us don't have the resources to get there. I just see myself as a resource for people. Coming up next, she's so many things. We might as well add hip hop head. Let me show. <laughs> Woo! You got, you got Wu Tang tracks. Ooh, hello. kids, man. I don't know what she's thinking. I feel like when parents reach a certain age, they just get lonely. She wants me to make her something she can watch Law & Order with. 
Get a chinchilla, lady. Why do I have to make a human? She tries to butter it up. Hun, it's a miracle. It's a life that grows inside of you. That sounds more like an alien invasion. What's interesting is that we've had several comedians come on, and you guys all seem to have that common thing. Like, it is, I make people laugh, I make myself laugh. It is cathartic. It's, it's you know, it's almost therapy, and it just feels good to make people understand that they can just, you know, escape for a couple minutes. Yes. Right? It's a cool thing. It is a cool thing, and for me, it's a... It's the way I've always communicated with the world. I think I understood the world through humor for myself and created my own language for myself to be able to understand how the world works and as a coping mechanism for me. And because of that, it's laughter has become a language and humor is a language. And you're either fluent in it in a certain way or you're not. And, and the beauty of comedy is there's something for everybody. Yeah. You know, I think Tina Fey said something that always stuck with me. She said, just because you decide you don't like something doesn't mean it's empirically not good. And just because you decide you don't like a certain comedian doesn't mean they're not good. They're just not for you. But you're on tour. Yes. Um, city winery tour that's coming through Philly and then New York uh, and, and throughout New York, going to your area further up in New York. Yep. Uh, what are we going to see on a Jesse Bay Peluso city winery and comedy tour? You know, my stand up is definitely relatable it's fun it's lighthearted, and i also go into a little bit of you know the real topics of life it's really a time for you to come have a couple glasses of wine hang out get away from your husband get away from your wife get away from your kids get away from the bills piling on the table from all your responsibility it's a break from your responsibility your stress and just come and laugh and have a good time leave feeling good about yourself and leave feeling a little better about everything that's going on in the world that's all i really have to offer is a break from whatever you're going through that for me is the fuel that keeps me going knowing that my silliness has created some solace for somebody so that's what you can get and I might even have a cute outfit on you never know a little inspiration what? a little muppet chic People, she is a great follow on social media as well. I encourage everybody to follow her. There's too much stuff to promote. Like, we're talking about the tour. You're on, like, every podcast. You have your own podcast, funny and, and serious and depth, and you try to encourage people to wear Crocs. Like, you have all kinds of things. Croc Nation. Oh Croc God. Nation. You, ha you have Wu-Tang Clan Crocs? I have... Do you want me to show them? Wait, hold on. We got time. One second. Let me get my Wu-Tang Crocs. Hold on. <laughs> Lying about the Wu-Tang Crocs. Let me just show you. Let me show. Woo! You got, you got Wu-Tang Crocs. Ooh, hello. Hi. I can't decide Hi. if that's the coolest thing or just like, wow. You know what it is. It's, it's awesome. You know what it is. <laughs> the 36 chambers. Wu-Tang's for the children. Protect your neck. I got nothing else. Coming up next on The Pulse, why Jessie Mae Peluso takes her platform to help others very seriously. What using your voice for good means to me is not using it for yourself, but using it for your neighbor, for your friend, for someone else, for your community. For I floated this past weekend and some deep sadness was released. So what's floating? Floating is uh, these sensory deprivation tanks. So basically, it's a tub for you to cry in and fill your own tears with. That's what we're doing. We're getting into somebody else's tub filled of tears, and we're filling it a little bit more with our own tears. The Pulse is based on the concept of use your voice for good. So we asked everybody to end the show with what use your voice for good means to them. What using your voice for good means to me is not using it for yourself, but using it for your neighbor, for your friend, for someone else, for your community, for the world. Using it for the betterment of your life beyond you in the bubble that you live in. Because I think we need to do a little bit more of that. I like it. Jesse Mae Peluso, thank you for taking time out of your schedule. This was fun. I appreciate you sharing yourself with us and the Pulse audience. Yeah, I know. <laughs>
God. <laughs> no. Tay! I feel like you're gonna need like a link at the bottom of your page because people are gonna be running out trying to buy Wu Tang oh, Crocs. These are limited editions, baby. What? Limited editions for what? the fishies. You yep, got if customized you Wu Tang Crocs. Listen, you can't sleep on these. They're gone. Bye. I'll I'll sell these and donate it to Alzheimer's Association. <laughs> Guys, thank you so much for watching The Pulse. I feel like we should have ended with like me decked out in Wu-Tang gear or something like that. That was fun. Uh, check out her shows, check out her comedy routine. And I absolutely appreciate her sharing both the funny but the serious side of Jesse Mae Peluso. I hope you enjoyed it, as I often say, as much as I did. Make sure you check out the podcast. You can get the full unedited version of the discussion. You also can head on over to YouTube and see past episodes and Fox local app, All Connected TVs. Make sure you download that app so you can watch us at your fingertips on your connected TVs anytime. And coming soon on The Pulse, multiple time Olympian, Gail Devers. It's not what other people believe about you, it's what you believe about yourself and how much you're willing to work when I write my goals down, I write them on sticky notes, and I write them for a reason. There's something that, it's a realistic goal. It's not something that says, hey, I want to run two seconds in 100 meters. That's not realistic. Thank you so much for watching, and I leave you today as I always do, reminding you that whenever you can, use your voice for good and have a good one.